Um, it is my pleasure to actually introduce Tim um, for a formal presentation uh, uh, now. Tim is uh, an, uh, a research fellow within the JBI Evans-based Healthcare Research Division, and he's also our, research, our lead research fellow for uh, JBI Adelaide Grade Centre. Uh, some of the other hats he wears is that he's a chair and convener of the JBI Effectiveness Review Group, the JBI Predatory Publishing Practices Group, and the JBI Prevalence Reviews Group, or JBI Persist. And he's been doing a lot of work uh, as part of his role as uh, in the Effectiveness Review Group with uh, risk of bias tools. And he's going to present some of this work to us all today. So, Tim, over to you. Cheers. Uh... What I'm going to talk to you today about is um, the tools, the critical appraisal tools that we use at JBI uh, are changing. And this may impact some of you in how you go about doing your critical appraisal for your, for your systematic reviews. Now, uh, before we get into this, I just do want to acknowledge that um, I am doing, I am presenting this work that was done um, as part of my work in the effectiveness methods group um, and the people that have worked equally hard um, with me on this work, are obviously myself, Zach, uh, Jennifer, um, uh, who, who are all on the call today, uh, Miloslav, um, Ed, who I'm sure you've met, but I'm not sure is on the call today, uh, Joe, and uh, Catalan, um, and I just uh, also want to mention that um, Catalan was a very big part of um, the old effectiveness methods group uh, a few years ago, and uh, the current chapter as it sits is largely due to a lot of his work, and he was instrumental in um, a lot of the work that we've done uh, currently, and unfortunately he uh, passed away uh, middle of last year. I just want to acknowledge that we really couldn't have got uh, to where we, where we are now uh, at JBI and in this work I'm about to present without Catalan's input. So, risk of bias and tool structure. So, everyone here, you all need to do some form of critical appraisal in your work. This is a, 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 a standard. You're all JBI master students and you will need to do this. You're not doing scoping reviews. You're doing some kind of systematic review methodology. And so, all of you will at some point need to do critical appraisal. And the process of critical appraisal is going to be different um, for each student. Uh, I know my students, um, at least previously, uh, so she was one of my students and, and I've got multiple of my students online today. Um, I typically directed them to using the Cochrane Risk of Bias 2.0 tool. I know different, different supervisors will direct their students to use different tools. Um, and obviously if you're doing a qualitative review, you're going to use the JBI critical appraisal instruments or our qualitative um, evidence as well. So, Although you all need to do this process, uh, the methods in, in how you follow this process uh, sometimes can be unique to you and your supervisor. In our quantitative reviews, we call critical appraisal the process of assessing risk of bias. And I'm going to be very strict on myself today in using this term. So if I slip up, please catch me out, that we are trying to assess risk of bias for our quantitative reviews. Now, this is just a little bit of recap because um, I know you've all seen this slide before because it's taken directly out of the CSR uh, program. Bias, we define bias as being a systematic error or deviation from the truth in the results or the inferences that we're making from our research. This is our primary research. This is our, uh, our systematic review research, so our, our analysis results. And bias, can, ar can, can arise itself, it, it can be um, uh, uh, caused in studies when we design the study. So we inherently may design a study that is going to be biased when we conduct the study. So our actions in conducting the study can introduce bias or when we analyze the data from our study. All of these three aspects can introduce bias into the results that we're collecting from that particular study. Now, what we're trying to do as, uh, as primary researchers, but also as secondary researchers, is implement safeguards to protect against bias, or at least minimize the risk of bias. We always acknowledge that there's going to be a risk of bias, but we need to minimize that risk. So this is really important because when we take 
the effects of bias into consideration, the results, especially of synthesized research, they can change and they can change importantly. So what we see here is a, um, this is an example of what we would call a bias adjusted meta-analysis. And this was conducted by uh, Jennifer, who's on, on the call today. Um, this is a, a, another form of uh, uh, model, which we can use when we're running our meta-analysis. You're all familiar, or I would hope you're all familiar with the fixed effect and the random effects model. Um, this is another form of model that we can use the bias, uh, a, a bias adjusted. Now, in this particular example, we see that uh, what we're looking at, sorry, I should, should define, this is a meta-analysis for paracervical local anesthetic pain management. And a paper uh, was published in the BMJ. And what this paper suggested was that paracervical injection, local anesthetic, it was uh, better than other types of local anesthetic for pain control. However, in reality, it's highly ineffective. And it was actually associated with increased pain in the women that underwent uh, this, this particular procedure. And so what Jennifer did with her team is they did a secondary analysis on the results of that meta-analysis using a bias-adjusted uh, model. And then what they see is that when, when you control for the bias inherent in these individual studies, that our, our final result is actually going to be no longer significant. So by appropriately controlling for bias in our synthesized results, the, or the final finding of something that was significant and, and was recommended for our, our patients uh, turned out to be not significant. So it is really important that we control for this in our, uh, in our research, especially in our, um, our, our secondary research, our systematic reviews, because our results of our systematic reviews do in, uh, influence the practice that is delivered to patients. Again, um, I'm not going to go too much into this because um, uh, we, uh, we, we don't need to, I don't think so. Um, but these are the, the main types of biases that I know you will have been exposed to before because, again, this is a slide taken directly from our, our teaching material. We have introduced you all previously to types of biases such as uh, selection bias, performance bias, uh, detection bias, attrition bias, reporting bias, and other biases. Um, the description of it, and then how we can uh, uh, control for that type of bias. In this example, what they've done is they've we, we've aligned it with the type of bias and the domain in the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool. However, um, uh, basically the point is selection bias we can control with random sequence generation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what you may not have seen before is that those labels, um, uh, they're, they're quite outdated. Um, so those labels actually came from Cochrane's Risk of Bias 1 tool. And that old tool really isn't being used anymore, um, or at least it's certainly being phased out by, by, by Cochrane and, and by other um, um, organizations. And so where we had the tool, where we had the domain such as random sequence generation or allocation concealment, in the new Cochrane Risk of Bias 2.0 tool, they've consolidated this in risk of bias arising from the randomization procedure. And so there are these new terms that are slowly uh, uh, being emerged. So we have here in this right-hand column, biases that are related specifically to randomized controlled trials. On the left-hand column, you'll see that there are a few more, and that's because in our non-randomized studies of interventions, we have different types of biases that um, uh, arise. And that's simply because we can't randomize these studies. We, we don't have that aspect in the methodology in how these studies are, are conducted. And so they are at risk of different types of biases, bias due to confounding and selection of participants into the study and the classifications of the interventions. I bring this up because it's important that we realize that um, risk of bias methodology changes. This change occurred within the same organization within a few years of each other. And it's important that we at JBI also recognize and adapt with these changes. Um, it's very important that we make sure that our methodology is still in line with current best practice. So the next thing I want to introduce everyone 
to is tool structures in risk of bias or critical appraisal um, instruments. Uh, as you may have noticed, and as something that we've said multiple times, there are multiple different tools available for you to do your critical appraisal um, uh, in your study or your risk of bias assessment. And there are three main types of tool structures that are typical when doing a systematic review or, or any evidence synthesis really. We have our scales, we have domain-based tools and checklists. Most tools that are available are based on the type of study design. So as I'm sure you're all familiar with, we've got the JVI critical appraisal tools that are based on study design. We've got a tool for RCTs, a tool for quasi-experimental studies, the list goes on and on. Some tools can be used across study designs. And this is, uh, this is an interesting point. It's not the point of my talk, um, but it is an interesting new area that, that can be worked into in, in risk of bias science. But let me just get into some of these tool structures now. So first of all, we have our scales. When we're doing, when, when critical appraisal is performed using a scale, we are scoring each, each question against uh, a, a, a set of questions, sorry, we're, we're looking at a set of questions, I should say, uh, and you can answer that question in a range from zero to two. Each item is uh, presented, we're looking at the safeguards that the study has implemented to minimize the risk of bias, and then we score each question as a zero to two, and then we produce a quantitative quality score. And we do that for each study that we've appraised in our particular systematic review. An example of this is the downs and the black checklist that I have uh, presented, presented here. This is a, a critical appraisal instrument that uses a scale. The second type uh, of, of tool is the domain-based tool. Uh, and this is uh, the, the type of uh, tool that Cochrane's um, instruments fall into. What, they, what we do is that we divide uh, our domains of bias up and we are assessing risk of bias at each domain level. So we don't have specific questions that are established, but we're looking at the domains of bias as a whole. So for example, when we're looking at selection bias, we can address uh, random sequence generation and allocation. So both of these things impact selection bias. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the strategies considered to minimize the risk of bias per domain. The thing with domain-based tools is that we don't generate quantitative judgments because we, we are assessing things as according to a high risk of bias, and that's these red dots, a low risk of bias, the green dots, or an unclear risk of bias, which is the yellow question marks. So we're producing qualitative judgments, and these qualitative judgments describe the, the value of the study itself. So this is what uh, the Cochrane Risk of Bias 2.02 actually looks like. Um, so they have what we call signaling questions. And basically they're just questions to get you to think about the safeguards that the study needed to implement in order for the domain of bias to be assessed appropriately. So was the allocation sequence random and our responses are no longer, a, a, they're not a score from zero to two, but they're these qualitative, yes, probably yes, probably no, no, or no information. So all of these, all of these signaling questions have been grouped, if you can see, according to the appropriate domain that they belong to. Now this is a domain-based tool. So Cochrane Risk of Bias 1 tool follows this, the Cochrane Risk of Bias 2.0 follow, follows this, as well as uh, Robbins. Now, uh, uh, there is Robbins I and Robbins E. Robbins stands for Risk of Bias in Non-Randomized Studies. For Robbins I, it's Risk of Bias in Non-Randomized Studies of Interventions. And Robbins E is Risk of Bias in Non-Randomized Studies of Exposures. Robbins follows a very similar approach. It's, it's actually designed after the, um, uh, uh, the Cochrane Risk of Bias 
uh, 2.02 in that we have our signaling questions here and then our response options being normally yes, probably yes, probably no, no or no information. Um, so these are examples of domain-based tool. And as you can see, they're getting um, more and more complex as we, as we move on. Uh, in, in answering a domain or using a domain-based tool, it becomes quite complex in how to use it. Finally, we have checklists. Now, the JBI critical appraisal tools are checklists. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. We, in the JBI tools, we present questions and the answering of these questions, they're not scored in a scale like the downs and black, but they're, um, they're, they're scored with met, unmet, not applicable or no information um, uh, or unclear, I believe it's, it, it is. Um, but basically what we're doing is we're checking the safeguards of each study uh, appraised against this checklist and, and they can be scored as basically either met or unmet. And again, these are, these are designed on um, study design. So as I said, we have a tool for uh, RCTs, tool for quasi-experimental studies, on and on and on. Now, the JBI checklists uh, are unique in that they uh, allow, well, they, sorry, I should say, they don't prescribe you to follow any particular approach. The JBI checklists can be uh, used using a domain-based approach if you're if you're scrupulous enough, uh, enough to realize what each question aligns to. You can use these uh, as a scale if you assign quantitative values to a score of met or unmet. But at JBI, we're deliberately um, uh, well, we deliberately don't provide prescriptive guidance and leave it up to the review team how they want to use our checklists. So that was just a very brief introduction into the types of tools available to us. The JBI critical appraisal tools, we use these to provide an overall critical appraisal uh, of the evidence. And as I already said, we don't subscribe to any particular approach in how to utilize these tools. These tools can be uh, if, you, if you understand risk of bias science, you can use these tools along a domain-based approach, although it's not necessarily intuitive. You can use these tools following a, a, a scale approach. Like you can ascribe quantitative uh, a value to um, a score of yes or, or a no or met or unmet. And so because we don't prescribe subscribe to any particular approach, I think that also lends itself to these tools being quite popular and being um, useful to people. But this also leads to a few problems in not just how we use our tools, but risk of bias assessment as a science. Firstly, there is currently, or there has been, um, very little consensus to how to classify internal validity safeguards. And I'm going to, I'm going to unpack what that means as we, as we um, move on throughout this uh, uh, talk. There is ambiguity between uh, for, for what domain of bias each question relates to. This is very specific to the JBI tools uh, in that only people that are particularly adept at risk of bias assessment will intuitively think that questions one, two, and five of the RCT tool relate to selection bias, for example. And they're the questions about randomization, allocation, concealment, and baseline characteristics. We, there is also a problem with the tools in that um, we present questions and, and constructs that don't necessarily relate to internal validity. And when we're trying to assess risk of bias, that is what we're trying to determine, the internal validity of a study, not whether it was reported well enough, not whether uh, the statistics have been performed appropriately. So if you've achieved statistical conclusion validity, we're interested in internal validity. The development of these tools is not particularly uh, well described, or at least it's not particularly well described for all tools. Some of these tools have very well described methods and some of them uh, do not. I've already discussed that they contain elements not related to bias. So we've got some of the tools have questions about reporting quality uh, and ethics, which again, aren't related to assessing the internal validity of a particular study. 
And finally, the JBR tools or, and many tools uh, around, there is no empirically validated tool to assess risk of bias for multiple designs. And this will lead on to um, something that I'm going to talk about uh, in a moment. So let's get part two. How are we going to safeguard against these particular problems if they do exist? So first thing, we know that our tools are popular. We know that they're easy to use. And, and we know this through mainly um, ad hoc feedback. So people that publish in our journal that use our tools provide feedback to people like our editors, like Ed and, and, and Cindy and some of our other editors about the use of the tools. We know through training of the Comprehensive Systematic Review Training Program that uh, Ed and Cindy uh, run and myself and Daniel teach into, that when we teach these tools, that they're easy for particularly novices to, to learn and, and to pick up, they're easy to interpret. And so we know at least um, in this subjective way that they are popular, that they are useful to a, a wide range of people. So although we know that they're useful, they are outdated. Um, they are particularly limiting um, when we are comparing them against newly updated tools. Um, and it's very important to, to realize that this as an area of science and academic inquiry is constantly evolving. And we can't remain stagnant here whilst this field of science continues to evolve. There's a few things that particularly impact the current suite of JBR tools. The first, something that I've already mentioned, is that there is no clear alignment between the current questions as they exist in the JBI critical appraisal tools with the domain of bias that they are interested or the related with. So it, there, is, there is no clear understanding there. There is also the presentation of multiple constructs, as I'm calling them, uh, within these tools. And some of these don't relate to internal validity. And when we're, again, when we're assessing risk of bias for our quantitative studies, that's what we're interested in. We're not interested in reporting bias, uh, sorry, not reporting bias, reporting quality or statistical conclusion validity or external validity, for example. We're interested in internal validity. So at the Effectiveness Methods Group, we decided that there were these problems and do we make a new tool or not? So the first thing that we did as an exercise was that we identified some ideal characteristics of a JBI tool, but any risk of bias tool. The first is that ideally, a single tool should facilitate comparisons across different analytic study designs using a common scale. Now, I'm, I'm very important here. I'm no longer referring to qualitative studies. I'm only going to be talking about our quantitative analytical study designs um, because it's they're very different processes uh, uh, when we're critically appraising qualitative research and we're assessing the risk of bias in quant research. So for our quantitative analytical uh, with those hats on, any tool should facilitate comparisons across different analytic study designs. It needs to be sophisticated enough to not only consider the presence or absence of methodological safeguards, but any potential that their presence or lack thereof may present and how that may present risk of bias. So for example, is the lack of blinding of an outcome assessor important for objective outcomes? We have an objective outcome of mortality. Do we need to make sure our outcome assessors are blinded for that particular outcome? I, I, I don't think so. And I don't think it really changes the assessment of risk of bias for that particular outcome if we don't have that safeguard present. We need to focus only on issues related to risk of bias or internal validity. Reporting quality, external validity, um, statistical conclusion validity need to be assessed in other specialized tools. Um, these constructs are not related to the assessment of risk of bias. And it needs to include the use of signaling questions, safeguards that are organized, that clearly align to a domain of bias. The fifth, in, it has to map clearly to a comprehensive framework taxonomy of bias, and this bias is going to be structured into different levels. It needs to align with grade. It needs to be user-friendly, obviously, 
and it needs to be valid. It needs to be evidence-based or at least meta-epidemiologically sound um, based on the latest up-to-date evidence about risk of bias science. So I'm just now want to focus on step five here. We need to map our risk of bias tool to a comprehensive framework or taxonomy of bias that's structured into different levels. This was the first thing that we did in this update procedure. Essentially, we took every single tool uh, for our quantitative analytic study designs. Um, so again, we did not look at any of our qualitative studies. We did not look at any of our, uh, our uh, non-analytic quantitative study designs. And we mapped the questions presented there. And we mapped them to multiple other previous, I'm just get my pen, uh, previous um, critical appraisal instruments. So we mapped this question. So the first question in the RCT tool is, was true randomization used for assignment of participants to treatment groups? And we wanted to determine where this question, what domain of bias did it sit in for each of these uh, uh, established tools that are available, these peer-reviewed established tools to uh, assess risk of bias. We then wanted to assign a JBI domain, and this is a, a newly created domain. So we did this for each question. So the first thing we did was, was true randomization used. That question aligns to the bias of selection and allocation. For the master standard, it aligns to this equal prognosis. Rob uh, ROB 1.0 calls this random generation, a random sequence generation. 2.0 arising from the randomization process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we just wanted to map where our questions in our tools existed in this framework, in this hierarchy um, of current tools. So we did this for every question that was presented. It took a long time. Uh, and then this allowed us to create a new or as we keep saying, a revised tool for critical appraisal. A few caveats. Firstly, in the revised tool, no question has been changed from the existing JBI critical appraisal instruments. Now, this was a really important thing for us. One, we didn't want to um, uh, deviate too much from our current tools in terms of the questions that they're presented. However, it was very important for us for in these revised tools to align each question that we presented with a, I put category of validity and we've actually changed that terminology with a construct of validity and a domain of bias where appropriate. We've also aligned questions so we can make judgments at what we call outcome levels and result levels. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, for our commencing students, you might remember because we talked about this on, on Monday, our risk of bias assessment will change for objective outcomes compared to our subjective outcomes sometimes. And that's because the outcome measurement uh, uh, is going to be or can be different. In my previous example, we may not need to blind our outcome assessors for an objective outcome like mortality but we may need to blind our outcome assessors for outcomes of self-report or um, doctor-diagnosed um, outcomes like that. That's where outcome bl uh, blinding of the outcome assessor is important. But it obviously means that our risk of bias is going to change for each outcome that's presented in the systematic review. So our new tools need to allow our reviewers to assess risk of bias at multiple outcome levels. Our current tools don't do that. Our current tools only facilitate people assessing risk of bias at the study level, which is a huge limitation of what they can currently do. Um, some questions like was true randomization used obviously can only be answered at the study level. True randomization is going to impact every outcome present. It also needs to be able to present data at the result level. So for each outcome that you presented, you may have multiple levels of results. So a, a primary RCT may have an outcome of mortality, but then they've got an unadjusted outcome. And then they've got adjusted outcomes to different levels of confounding. So 
at that level, we are result, uh, we are appraising risk of bias not only at the outcome level, but also at the result level for each outcome. And so it can get quite layered and, and it can get quite big here. But again, this is what is currently best practice for, for risk of bias science and methodology. So this should read constructs, apologies for the um, error. Constructs of validity that we've included include internal validity, and I've already talked about internal validity. Internal validity answers questions about bias. Is the study free from systematic error or bias? Statistical conclusion validity. Statistical conclusion validity is specific to uh, assessing whether the results of a study are adequate depending on the data analysis conducted. Now, this doesn't necessarily introduce bias in all cases. Sometimes it, it, it does. Sometimes it's only related to what we call statistical conclusion validity. The third uh, uh, construct of validity was the comprehensiveness of reporting. So have, has, has the study reported on things such as ethics? Have they clearly identified confounders? This is not the same as controlling for confounders. So have they clearly identified them, labeled their importance? All of these things are constructs of validity. We have another construct of validity that we've identified, um, and I've got this separately because it's important to note that none of the current questions in the JBI tools align to this external validity construct. External validity relates to whether the results can be generalized or not. And whilst it's important to note, uh, I also want to clarify that none of the None of the tools currently have a question related to external validity. So very quickly, this is just a summary of the constructs of validity and an example of them within our checklists. So a question that relates to internal validity is question one of the RCT tool. Was true randomization used for assignment of participants to treatment groups? Something that related to statistical conclusion validity was appropriate statistical analysis used? Comprehensiveness of reporting, were the study subjects and the setting described in detail? These are, all, these are real questions presented in our tools and examples of how these questions align to different constructs of validity. And what's important is that when we're trying to assess risk of bias, we are looking at this, not these types of questions. So for every question that aligns to internal validity, we then assign a domain of bias. And I talked about this very briefly when I went through the mapping procedure. Firstly, the first bias uh, domain was bias related to selection and allocation. Then administration of the intervention or the exposure, assessment, detection, and measurement of the outcome, participant retention, temporal precedence, classification of the exposure, confounding factors, and selective reporting. Now, some of these may be new to you, particularly things such as temporal precedence, classification of the exposure. Um, very simply, it's because temporal precedence and, uh, is going to be more related to our non-randomized studies of interventions. And, and what we're trying to determine with temporal precedence is that there is a clearly uh, a, a linear progression of the let's, I'm going to say intervention to the outcome. So there's no potential contamination there. Um, most of these, hopefully, you're, you're familiar with. Again, a quick example of, of the uh, type of bias and then the methods that we can use to reduce bias. I'm not going to go through all of these because you should be familiar, but temporal precedence, we need to see a clear perspective sequence of the exposure um, or the intervention and the outcome. So a causal relationship can be inferred. Classification of the exposure, we need to make sure that the classification of the exposure is not influenced by knowledge of the outcome. Confounding factors you should be aware of and selective reporting and publication bias, again, you should be, should be aware of. So hopefully there's not, not too much new here. What I'm gonna do now is very quickly run through, if I just change my screen, run through what this new tool looks like. And I think this might be the best way to explain what this, how this is going to be used in practice.
and, and this might be very important, particularly to our commencing students, because this will be out very, very soon. And if you're going to use the JBI critical appraisal tools, you'll be using these tools. So first thing you'll notice is that the questions have not changed to the current JBI critical appraisal tool. Uh, the important thing is um, the questions themselves haven't changed from the current tools. The guidance about how to answer these questions has changed only so slightly. So for those people that um, are currently undergoing their critical appraisal or um, have done it, how you have done it shouldn't have changed drastically. But what's important is how we align these types of questions with the domains and our uh, outcomes and results. So let's just, let's try to run through it. First thing that we've done, can you all see my mouse moving on the screen? If I do this, yeah, excellent, all right. First thing you'll notice is that we have uh, aligned our questions. So we have moved their position in the checklists. This is the checklist for RCTs, by the way. We have moved them according to whether they answer a question of internal validity. And then for all of those that do answer a question of internal validity, they have been again assigned to what domain of bias they answer. So questions one, two, and three all relate to bias related to selection and allocation. We can answer these the exact same way using the exact same guidance. So how we answer these questions has not changed, just where they're positioned has. Bias related to administration of the intervention and the exposure. So again, questions four, five, six all relate to this particular domain of bias. Question seven, this is related to bias related to the assessment detection and the measurement of the outcome. This is where things start getting different and this is where you may need to uh, employ slightly different methods that you may have done previously. This, qu uh, this question, were outcome assessors blind to treatment assignment is obviously going to change depending on what outcome you're assessing for, uh, for its risk of bias. So we've given you the template for seven outcomes. Now we've chosen seven because that is the current RAID recommendation for the number of outcomes that we should include in our systematic reviews. There is some empirical evidence that when we're making recommendations, uh, seven outcomes is the best uh, or, or is the easiest to facilitate these, uh, these decisions and these recommendations. And so we've given you allowance to assess risk of bias for seven different outcomes in a particular study, but you can add or subtract as you need. This is not a, a strict requirement. Same goes for question eight. Question eight also belongs to this domain of bias, uh, and we've aligned that to the, uh, uh, the outcome level, as does question nine. Question 10 is related to bias related to participant retention. And this example, we now have questions that can be answered not only at the outcome level, but also the result level. So same procedure, we have our outcome and then all the types of results that may fit under that particular outcome. Again, we've, we've just given you three, but there may only be one, there may be 10. Um, these can be added uh, at will. So this is where it starts getting quite long. And frankly, I don't know how I can make this not appear to be long in a document such as this uh, and trying to prescribe to the best, the best um, evidence and how we should do risk of bias, it will always be quite long. The next thing that we've done is we've separated the questions that are not, relate, not related to internal validity. So these questions are specific to what we call statistical conclusion validity. Were participants analyzed in the groups to which they were randomized? This is not necessarily a question related to um, uh, the internal validity, let's say. It's related to us, how well we can um, make inferences from our data from the statistics performed. It can be measured at the outcome level. Question 12, was appropriate statistical analysis used? Again, outcome and result uh, uh, level. And finally, 13, was a trial design appropriate? The biggest things here is that the questions themselves haven't changed. How you answer these questions haven't changed. And so I hope they don't cause too many headaches to people that are doing their critical appraisal. I think that they will, uh, well, they should um, make it easier for people to understand where they're, where, how the question they're ans answering, I should say, how that aligns to a domain of bias, um, because that's really important and something that our current tools don't do or don't do intuitively. Um, additionally, 
it is the first time we've offered a tool that allows us to assess risk of bias at outcomes and results level, which again is very important and aligns with current best practice in this space, something that we should be doing. Uh, and frankly, fixes a big hole in our, in our current um, uh, tools. I'll just jump back to my slides. So that was just a very quick example of the RCT tool. Um, these tools will be coming out soon. Uh, uh, definitely this year, uh, we hope to have all of them out at, at some point. And uh, again, I just want to re uh, say once more that we're not doing this for all the tools. Um, some tools it's definitely not appropriate to do. We're going to be doing this for randomized controlled trials, quasi-experimental studies, cohort studies, analytical cross-sectional, case control, case series, and our prevalence studies. So I'm more than happy to go through the new tools um, with anyone, not just our commencing students, but anyone at any point if you need help or guidance. Um, we are planning on submitting this for publication very, very soon. There's going to be a paper that introduces everyone to the tool, um, the methods that we use to make them, uh, how we answer each question, which I would hope to have out within the next two weeks. Um, and then the tools themselves will quickly follow. So yeah, uh, thank you all for allowing me to look at you. Thanks, thanks, Tim. That was awesome and very, very clear as well. We, we have some time for questions or comments or reflections. Does anyone have any thoughts they want to share with Tim? Um, yeah, Tim, that was a great great presentation. I enjoyed that. Um, I'm just wondering with the tool, um, you've separated the questions now into different domains. Um, and it sort of looks a bit like the, um, the risk of bias tool that I use in my work, which is the Cosman checklist. Um, I'm just wondering how um, with this new tool, it's scored. Um, uh, I, when I use a Cosman checklist, as we score different questions, um, it's a worse score counts principle. So if risk of bias or one particular question in the domain you know, shows high level of risk of bias, it doesn't matter whatever result you get for the remaining questions in that area, um, the outcome is um, you know, high level of risk of bias. Uh, great question. It is um, completely up to the review team. We're, we're being very unprescriptive with how you should use this tool. And we leave it quite open to allow the review team to follow any approach. So it's really up to the review team themselves if they want to say follow up, uh, if, if, um, if they want to weight questions differently or they want to um, say if, if a, a yes is a score or a, or a value, then they can provide quantitative uh, results if they want, but it is completely up to the review team. There is really no no prescriptive guidance that we will provide. Um, and it's even in the manual, I think, um, Zach, correct if I'm wrong, that it's totally up to the review team as well. Yeah, quite different to the Cosman checklist, which has um, you know, quite a, a, a tight set of uh, standards. So when you're using the Cosman checklist, you also use the, um, the manual uh, as to how to interpret the results. And it, it is, um, yeah, it's quite tight and prescriptive. Um, in terms of how you actually um, you know, sort of answer the question. But yeah, thanks, that answers the question for me, Tim. Thanks. Yeah, I'm good. They're very different to Cochrane's as well. They're very different to a lot of tools that give you quite strict guidance, but yeah.